All right, so what we're going to talk about today is something that's called cognetics and the locus of attention. Who's ever heard of those? Yeah, nobody. That's what I expect. That happens every semester. What you're going to find, though, is again, with the topic that we're going to be discussing today, there are a lot of things that, if you really think about it, you deal with on a daily basis that you really are aware of sometimes, especially when you have an interface that's not working very well in this, uh, in this manner. But where the, where the goal is, where we want to create products that are so well integrated with how we as humans do, do things that we don't really even notice that they're there. They're ubiquitous. Has anyone heard of ubiquitous before? Yes? Yeah, so it's basically, right now most of you are so used to just picking up your smartphone, you don't really think about it. Well, after you make a phone call, you just automatically pick up your smartphone. Very, very easy. It's integrated into our lives. That's what it means. Now, before we start actually talking about cognetics, one of the things I really want to elaborate on and try to open your mind about a little bit is, well, what's an interface? So let me ask you that. What is an interface? How would you define an interface? When you think of an interface, what comes to mind? Something you can interact with. Anything else? What the user sees. So something interactive that you interact with, it's what the user sees. Anything else? It's a way of accomplishing tasks. All right, so when we think about an interface, we think about it as it's a way of accomplishing tasks. It's how we interact with it. So it's, you know, what is it that you do and how it responds. It includes what the user sees. So the windows, the icons, the pull-down menus, the mice, those sorts of things. Now, one of the things about interfaces, usually one of the first answers I'll get in class, if you guys are smart, you look at my slides first, because you're brilliant, is we talk about an interface in terms of what we see on a computer screen or even what we see on a tablet. That's usually what we think about. But what I want you to do as you're going through this class is remember that an interface is much more broad than just what we see on a computer or what we see on a screen. It involves a lot of different elements, a lot of the ones that you've already mentioned, and it's not necessarily what we typically see as computing technology because computers and computing technology is being integrated with other products more and more. So if I asked you a question, does your car have an interface? Yeah, the answer is actually yes, it does. It's not what we typically think of as an interface, but it is an interface. But to think of it that way, you do need to think about it a little bit more broadly, particularly since we as IT people tend to think of what we tend to deal with ourselves. Make sense? It does. Now, there are a lot of interface designers out there. It's a very broad area. There's an increasing number of UX designers. And there are some really good products out there. But here's the problem. Even though there's an increasing number of interface designers, UX designers, and as we've talked about, there's a lot of different types of interfaces, how many times do you think when something new comes out, the consumers say that, oh, this is so much easier than it was 10 years ago? How often does that happen? Yeah, not very often. Not very often. You think of some exceptions. There are certainly some exceptions out there. So let's look at, um, let's say, smartphones. Right? On the one hand, with smartphones, assuming you have an internet connection, it makes it very easy to access your email. Right? Someone sends you an email, you can respond immediately. Hooray, we're all happy, right? What does that do to the rest of your life? What do you think? You have a job, you want your boss emailing you all the time? Some of you saying, yes, boy, I want you to work for me. No, 
if you actually talk to people, what you find is that, oh yeah, you know, I, I love having my email, but I can't get away from it. It hasn't made life any easier. So what is it that that tells us? Anyone? Well, one of the things that it tells us is that just because we provide a new technology, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to make things easier for us. The goal is to make things easier. And so if we go back to the example of the smartphone, there are actually things that it does make easier for our lives. Can anyone think of something that it makes it easier? Not the email, which is debatable. Sorry, what? Wait, I heard two, two people talking, and I'm not sure who. <laughs> Paying bills. Makes it much easier, right? You need to pay a bill. You're out with your friends. Oh, crap, I forgot to pay my credit card bill. You can do it right there. You don't have to do something like what you used to have to do is like, OK, I need to take my bill, and I need to go to the bank and pay it. Makes it much easier. Did you have some, something different? No? I'm sorry? It can make our lives easier. OK, let's look at calendars. You'll probably experience this more when you go out into a full-time position where you have to have a schedule and you have death by meeting. Very, very fun. You're out at one meeting. You have another meeting. You need to remember where it is and what time and with who. What do you do these days? Yeah, you look on your phone. Easy, piece of cake. What do you think you had to do before smartphones? Yeah, you have to carry this big fat planner, right? Or you had to go rushing back to your office to look it up on your calendar sitting on your desk. Or if you were lucky enough to have an administrative assistant, you call your administrative assistant and say, where am I going and what am I doing? So it does make things a lot easier. There's one thing about smartphones and the use of smartphones, as an example, that has made things easier for us. What is it that you would say is the difference between an app on a smartphone and an app on a desktop? And I'll give you a hint. It's much simpler. Right, so with smartphones, you have limited capabilities. It's much simpler to use. And we started using things like gestures, which people would have argued is a lot easier for us and natural as humans. So one of the things that we want to make sure we bring to our design is KISS. You guys all know what that is, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Don't overcomplicate it. Now, how hard do you think that is to do? It's actually really hard, particularly if you have a product that's really complex. So imagine, let's say, Microsoft Word. With all the functionality that's in Microsoft Word, how do you keep it simple? Not an easy job. I actually think that uh, Microsoft did a fairly good job considering how complex it is, putting aside the arguments that they keep changing the interface. It's a whole other argument. Right? But you pretty much you open it up and you see and you can start typing a document. That's pretty simple. You want to do something simple like making something bold? That's pretty simple. It's really important for us to keep in mind that the user needs things a lot more simplified than we as technology people are dealing with the back end code. We want to make it easier for people. They don't care what's going on on the back end like we do. So one of the things that we want to do to try to make things simpler and easier for us as humans is we want to engage in human-centered or user-centered design. I think I've mentioned this a couple times in class. This is another one of those terms I'm going to keep mentioning all semester. Human-centered design or user-centered design, as we've mentioned in this class, focuses on designing around what the user needs. 
not just what the technology needs or what the technology is capable of. And there are a number of things that go into this. So if you go to, let's say, a software development company, and you get a job there, and you look to see, all right, well, when we decide we're going to develop a new product, what's the process that you go through? All right, what's the first thing that we do? We try to find a need for users, right? That actually is part of the user-centered design process. But where we start deviating from that is we start off with this is what the user wants and the user needs. How do we build it? Once we start designing and building it, we have a tendency then to get further away from the users. So for example, domain experts are used extensively. It's very important to use domain experts. Right? They are experts in the arena of the product we're building, and we probably aren't. Right? We're experts in IT. What is the potential problem with using domain experts, as important as they are? What do you think is a potential problem? I'm sorry? Yes. Well, maybe they don't have people skills. It depends. Some don't. Do you? I'm sorry. Yes. Right. So what's easy for an expert, a domain expert, may not necessarily be easy for your typical user. So if you are only using domain experts, who are you designing for? Domain experts. So they're very important, but they are not your typical user. So what we want to do is we want to start with what's common to us as humans, us as users. Now, those typical users can be a little more difficult to be able to get a hold of. So we can actually just start by saying, what is it that I know about how humans work? Start there, and that will give me then time to develop something so that I have time to go and talk to my users. Hopefully, you'll have access to them. So we've actually been talking about a lot of things that are pretty common to all humans, right? how we perceive things, how we focus on things. That's what we're talking about. So we want to make sure that we build interfaces on what we know about human thought and behavior, as well as the behavior of our users. Now at this point, I've had students who stop and ask me, well, wait a minute, don't we have industry standards for designing this stuff? Do you guys know about any of the industry standards? For the web, W3C, sound familiar? or any of the ISO standards. You guys are so lucky you're going to learn about this. Basically, when it comes to designing products and designing software, there are industry standards out there. The ISO standards, for example, tend to be rather important and rather stringent. And in fact, if you know them and you work with them, and you are an expert in them, there are very specific positions that actually pay quite well. So there are ISO standards for security, so industry standards for security. Industry standards for project management. Industry standards for how to run a help desk. It's basically what are some of the best practices that we learned from both application and research. But here's the problem. Right now there isn't one for user experience. It's too young of a field. And there is also, at this point, too much variety in terms of how to best apply it 